There we go. Can you hear me now? That's just down there. It won't kick it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. Well, it's a real privilege to be here today. I, as I've said before, I love to speak. I love to preach. Um, there's a line in Chariots of Fire, one of my favorite movies, where Eric Little is up on the hillside with his sister, and his sister is all troubled because he's going to be running in the Olympics instead of being about his duties of being a missionary. And he says to his sister, God has made me fast. And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Well, when I preach, I feel God's pleasure, among other times as well. But, so I really appreciate Ryan giving us the opportunity, uh, affording us the opportunity to, to speak. So let's begin with prayer. Father, just uh, thank you for this morning, and I thank you for every person gathered. I pray for Carolyn out at camp today. I know she's been honored for all the time she did the cooking out there, and we, so many of us have enjoyed her good meals both there and here. And So we pray that you would bless her, Lord, today, that you would let her know how grateful everyone is for her gifts, for how she served the church. And uh, Father, once again, I pray that you would fill all of us with a great and extraordinary measure of your Holy Spirit. You know that apart from your Spirit, I left myself speechless. And so give me words today, Lord. Give me direction. Give me guidance. I pray that you would keep me from saying the things you don't want me to say and to say everything that you want me to say, Lord. And I pray for everyone here that you give us ears to hear, that you give us eyes to see and open hearts to receive the word that you have for us. I pray that you would continually teach us to walk in the Spirit, to be led of the Spirit, to know Jesus' kind and gracious heart, and to know that if God is for us, then who can be against us? And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So my wife and I were, were married. Let's not tip over into my face here. That'd be a good auspicious beginning again. Uh, my wife were, and I were married over in the other building with Howard uh, Johnson officiating and also Greg Oliver and then my dad, Ernie Christian, all three of them. So we were married by three ministers and they tied the, the, the knot tight. But I'm so blessed to have my wife at my side. After about a year, we went off to seminary. <clears throat> and when we first got to seminary, my teacher, my what was it? Systematics professor, Dr. John Weeborg, warned us that as we studied, our heads would get bigger and bigger with the knowledge of God, while our life of being with him, of loving him and living in his love, would grow smaller and smaller. We would become spiritually shriveled. At the end of two years, we had a class called Spiritual Formations to keep us from going there. <clears throat> But even with that, he warned that this could happen to us. At the end of two years, I was dry as desert sand, dry as overcooked toast. And I was going out on internship to a church in McPherson, Kansas, wonderful covenant church. And as I arrived, I was still dry as toast, and I was praying that prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 uh, for this reason. Um, we bow our knees before the Father from whom every family has, uh, derives its name, that you would grant us according to your riches, according to the power of the Spirit, that you would strengthen us in our inner being through the Spirit so that Christ may dwell in our heart through faith and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, might know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that we might be filled up with the fullness of God. And I was praying that for myself, for the church. And I was on my way down to Wichita to, to in, uh, visit a, about a 50-mile drive uh, to visit a, a parishioner, a, a church member that was in the hospital down there. 
And I turned on the radio, and I had lost track of this person, but one of my favorite ministers came on, and he was preaching on Psalm 23. And his words came like a healing balm over me, and he reminded me of grace and the unconditional, unfathomable, irresistible love of God. So I started listening to him again and growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our superintendent back then stopped by the church to see how I was, how I was doing as an intern. And he said, how are you doing, Grant? And I said, I'm doing really good. I'm once again caught a vision of God's grace and I'm growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he said, well, don't let it become cheap grace. Don't turn grace into a license to sin. And I was shocked. It was like, it was like falling in love with the most beautiful woman and then being warned about the premarital sex, right? Good warning, but... So, I'm <clears throat> coming upon a text today that is... Let me get a drink here. This is one of those landmark texts for me. Let's see if it'll hang here. There we go. This is one of those texts that when I discovered it, uh, it just shocked me. I was surprised by it. And so we're going to read it first, and I'm going to just try to follow along on the screen up there. For the grace of God, this is Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. I'm going to be focusing on 11 and 12 today, but I'll read through the rest of it at the end just to catch the last uh, couple lines. We read from Paul, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us to, de to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. So Paul is writing to Timothy or to Titus. It's one of the pastoral letters. Three, there's 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So he's giving pastoral instruction to Titus. He and some of the apostles in Titus had been on the island of Crete and had planted a lot of churches. But the, Cre the Cretans weren't doing so well. They were living as though there was no difference in their life from the other people on the island, from those who weren't saved. You know, when you get saved, there is an expected change of life, right? There is an expected difference to how we're going to live. And it's not brought on by our own actions, but by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit transforming our life from one degree of glory to another. So he warns Titus about setting up uh, some organization for the various churches, appointing elders and getting some overarching structure to the church. And I'll just, just to catch a couple verses of what it's like in the beginning of Titus, I find these words ironically humorous, maybe not so humorous. Titus 1.10, For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. So we're talking about Judaizers here. Who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars. Evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And I go, what? Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Let me put it another way. Olympians are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. You think, what is Paul quoting this? And then guess, guess what he says? He says, this testimony is true. That's, wow. That's kind of rude. For this reason, reprove them severely so they may be sound in the 
faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. That gives you a flavor of the book. He's warning Titus to get the Cretans kind of back in line. So you would expect him to give a renewed list of rules and kind of a, a, a guide for life. Instead, he, he gives them something else. So we move on to the first verse. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So we begin with the word for, for the grace of God. And the word expresses the reason for something that has just gone before. So if you read verses 1 through 10, you read the house rules in Titus. In Roman letters, they always gave house rules. You'll see them in Ephesians, Galatians. They're in almost every letter that Paul writes. It was customary to give house rules. And what they were, they were moral and ethical um, encouragement that you would give the recipients of your letter. So he gives house rules to the older men and then to the older women and subsequently to the younger women and then to the younger men and also to slaves, which in that day would have been, in our day, would have been akin to our blue collar workers, um, notwithstanding the tyranny of, of slavery. But So he's given 10 verses on encouraging house rules for these groups. And then he says, for the grace of God has appeared. And I've thought about, why would he talk about the grace of God in, right after giving house rules? And the grace of God is the reason for the house rules. And then I remembered the evil Cretans. You know, they're going to need some guidelines. Well, the house rules essentially aren't enough. If, if you, They needed something more than just a set of rules and ethical encouragement. And so then it says, for the grace of God has appeared. For the grace of God. So often we define grace as unmerited favor, which is a good definition. But grace is some, so much more than that. When I was uh, at Evergreen here, yes, I'm an Evergreener, I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, the further you get away from, farther you get away from Olympia back east, the, the better the school, ha the reputation of the school becomes. <laughs> So back in Chicago, Evergreeners were loved, but, um, but for the grace of God has appeared. I was taking a class by a Richard Alexander. He was six foot six, red hair of the hair he had remaining, and he was uh, Irish or Scottish, and he was a Shintoist from, you know, Japanese Shintoist, and he would go out to Japan and participate in the, in the Matsudi, the, the festivals. I talked to him about the Lord, but he says, I just can't bring myself to believe, Grant. But I wrote a paper on grace for him. I was wowed with grace in those days. And when I got the paper back, he said, you've missed half of grace, Grant. You focused on just being saved, but grace also gives you each day what you need to live. This Shintoist knew more about grace than I did. So... The grace of God is more than just undeserved, unmerited favor. I've come up with a de def definition over the years. I probably shared this in my last sermon, but it's grace is the undeserved, unmerited, kind and generous power and action of God to forgive, save, and transform forever broken and sinful lives. And such sits before you and such sits before me. The power of grace. My witness is not in what I've done for myself or how I've changed or I've, how I've been such a good Christian. My witness is in how the tender grace of God has transformed my life in ways that I don't even know how it works. I just know He's done it. By looking in the rearview mirror, by looking at the wake of my life, at the wake of his grace in my life, at the wake of his grace in your life. I look at my wife's life, and he has transformed her amazingly. She kept journals when I married her, and I won't go into the journals, but she's changed remarkably. 
And she's come into understanding a life of walking in the Spirit and resting in God's grace. Grace, the undeserved, unmerited, kind and generous power and action of God. So my friend Marlon Johnson, a good friend of mine, Pastor Howard's son, has pointed out to me that grace can never be separated from the giver of grace, from the one whose power it is. And so when it says, for the grace of God has appeared, it's talking about Jesus, really, and how he approaches us. Jesus approaches you always on the ground of his grace. I grew up with, with a Jesus with a baseball bat. And it wasn't until I was 23 in this church that I met the, the Jesus of grace. For the grace of God has appeared, so it's shown up. <clears throat> and it's talking about the appearance of Jesus. The word has appeared is an interesting word. It, it comes from the word from which we get epiphany, to have an epiphany. And so, in, in other words, we've had an epiphany of grace with Jesus showing up. And what does epiphany mean? It means uh, to be enlightened, to have light shone on something. So I love this picture. It's a sunrise. I had video, but the video wasn't working this morning, so we'll just go with the, the picture of the sunrise. For the grace of God has shone on us like the dawn from on high. And so in, in that sense, and grace gives you eyes to see. This undeserved power and action of God at work in our life gives us a new way of seeing. And then it says, bringing salvation to all people. And this, this makes me a little uncomfortable because it sounds like universalism, bringing salvation to all people. But that's, this is a very difficult little phrase to translate, this little clause. I won't bring in too much grammar here, but they've made it a prepositional uh, phrase, an ing verb. Not a prepositional, I'm sorry, a participial phrase, right? An ing verb describing grace. But actually, it's an adjective for salvation. We don't have an adjective for salvation. And so a better way to put it, for the grace... For the salvation to all people, grace. Do you hear that? For the salvation to all people, grace. Which brings up that it's open to everyone, even those evil Cretans, even those gluttonous Olympians. For the salvation to all people, grace of God has appeared. And the other interesting thing in this sentence is that that phrase has appeared... In the original language of the New Testament, if you wanted to emphasize something, the word order didn't matter, so you'd put it at the front of the sentence. I thought that grace would be at the front of the sentence. It's not. It's the word has appeared, that, that, that verb, has appeared. So what he's emphasizing is that grace has appeared, and it reminds me of the verse in John 1, 16 and 17. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So there's this implied contrast. The law was given through Moses, which was full of his grace. If you ever read Genesis, you'll get that, right? But then grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Just a note on that. I, I love the, says, for the, from, from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. It's literally grace in place of grace, or grace after grace. My wife and I love to go to the ocean, and I'm reminded of ocean waves coming in, and they incessantly come in. They, they never stop. One wave comes in, recedes. Another wave comes in, recedes. And that's God's grace in our life. There is wave after wave after wave of grace that comes crashing into my life. And I like the image of crashing because it's power. It's the power of God to cleanse a life, to wash a life. And it's true of all of us. In fact, when he says, for of his fullness we have all received. If you go to the end of John, he's writing it to those who don't believe. So everyone in the world is receiving God's grace. Every perfect heaven or every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no shifting shadow. 
So every person, every joy, every good, good meal out at Applebee's or wherever you like to go is a gift of his grace. And that grace just keeps coming in. I hope that image sticks with you. That when you're feeling down and discouraged, when you're feeling like, where is God? He's left me. Know that his grace keeps coming in. And when one wave recedes, there will be an, a, a fresh grace for that day. It continues, for the salvation of all people, grace of God has appeared, instructing us to not deny ungodliness and worldly desires. So I like putting for the salvation to all people, grace of God has appeared, instructing us, because it's the grace that instruct us, instructs us. So oftentimes we think that we need rules that will instruct, instruct us, right? Like maybe a little bit more of the law. But think about this. The law, which was perfect, righteous, and good, couldn't bring, us, couldn't bring the change in our life that we needed. In fact, Romans brings up five things that the law does. And I'm not going to read the whole verses, but I'll read the, the sections that, that matter. Well, maybe I will read them real quick. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in its sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So the first thing that the law does, it's a speed limit sign. I'm going 70 and suddenly I pass a speed limit sign. And it's 60, what has it told me? That I'm breaking the law. So the function of the law is to point out our sin. Romans 5.20, that was Romans 3.20. Romans 5.20, the law came in so that transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So when you put up law, when you put up a speed limit sign on I-5 in Seattle, do people go 60? We, were, we went there on Friday to a doctor's appointment, and Nancy was driving at 70 in, in the HOV lane, and people were flipping us off as they were going past us because we were only doing 70. I always like to be told I'm number one, but. <laughs> Romans 7, 5, for while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were arise, aroused by the law. So the law, there's nothing wrong with the law. It's us. You put that speed limit sign in front of me and I want to go 75. Or maybe 64, just enough so I know I won't get a ticket. Am I speaking to any of you right now? <laughs> Romans 7, 9 through 10. I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was, in, was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. So the law commends us. It, it gives us the death sentence because we've broken it. And lastly, so then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore did that which is good become a cause of death for me. May it never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good. So that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. So the more law you pile on me, the more I'm going to be aware of my sin, it's going to arouse my, my passions to go against God's law. It's going to condemn me to death. It's going to increase my transgression, not because of anything wrong with the law, but because of this wicked flesh, because of this wicked self. And it makes my sin utterly sinful. It's like the shaving mirror. You've been out camping for a week, and you come home, and you look in the mirror, and you go... Or the makeup mirror for you ladies. So this is completely different. For the salvation to all people, grace of God has appeared, instructing us. So grace teaches us. It instructs us. It's the image of teaching, uh, of disciplining uh, young children, not in the sense of punishment, but disciplining so they will know how to act. So grace is the thing that teaches us how to live and how to act. And it also teaches us how not to act. 
So it, it goes two ways. It teaches us to deny and it teaches us to live. So there's two negative things and three positive things. The first negative thing is that for the grace of God has appeared instructing us to deny ungodliness. Godlessness is another way of translating it. It's living as though God doesn't exist. It literally means to uh, be without worship of God. To not give Him the worship that He so deserves. My friend Paul Wilson, who uh, is in Boise right now, uh, used to, came out of this church and he, he said that, you know, one of our biggest problems in the church that, is that so oftentimes we're functional atheists. We give God all the lip service, but then we function as if he doesn't exist. Because it's all up to us. And this is exactly the opposite. When that powerful grace of God appeared, it instructed us to deny godlessness as though God doesn't exist. It taught us how to live as though God exists. And then moving on, it says, instructing us to deny worldly desires. Anybody have a problem with worldly desires? They can be big desires. They can be small desires. The, world, the word worldly conveys the idea of being at enmity with God, anything that is contrary, that's opposed to God. And desires, is, it's a strong word. It's, it's a word of passion. It's that craving that addicts have for another fix. It's that craving that, okay, I promised I won't eat an, 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 another meal like I just did. And then I go and do it again. What are some of the worldly desires we... Uh, crave after. Go ahead. Shout them out. Money. Money. Okay, that's a good one. Money. Power. Power. Food. Food. Yeah. Acceptance. Acceptance. And while we're talking about food, it's pizza. Okay. <laughs> Acceptance. Pardon? Fun. Fun. Yeah. Entertainment. Pleasure. That's a Comfort. huge one. Pardon? Comfort. 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 Oh, yes. I like my recliner. I have an electric recliner. If you come to the door, it takes me five minutes to get there because I have to... <laughs> so worldly desires, you, you get the drift. And what, what's, what instructs us to deny it? Not God's rules, but the power of God's grace. His grace instructs us. Wow. Wow. And then it, moving on, it says, well, one more word on that. Um, you know, we also often sin if you have a sin problem, then we just need to give you a little bit more law, a little bit more rules to curtail those sins. But all we're really doing is putting on a muzzle on your desires. You follow me? A muzzle. If you put a muzzle on the dog, does the dog still want to bite you? Oh, in fact, it wants to bite you even more. And so the grace of God is completely different. Uh, if we have a sin problem, we have a grace problem. We have not come to apprehend. We have not come to realize. We have not come to experience the depth of the power of God's grace to change a broken life. You follow me? Moving along, then it tells us in the positive way, instructing us, for the grace of God has appeared, instructing us to live sensibly. To live sensibly. This is a great one because literally it's soberly, and this is right up my alley since I'm a recovering al alcoholic and addict. But to live in a way that's moderate. Not to be... Nancy's laughing because my middle name is not moderation. Yeah. <laughs> I tell myself, going to cat cardiac rehab, I'm going to take it easy today. Once I get on that bike, it's like... <laughs> and then I pay for it. So, this is to live sensibly. And in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, we're given the fruit of the Spirit. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, patience, joy, kindness, gentleness. Uh, let's see, I'm missing one. But it ends with self-control. 
right? It's a different word, but same idea is to live, to live with self-control. So get this, self-control does not come from yourself. It comes from God's grace and literally the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Moving on, it says, for the grace of God has appeared instructing us to live righteously. This is uprightly, to live in a correct way, meaning not to sin, but to uh, how to live in right relationship with God. To live justly, it can mean that too, to live a just life. So oftentimes I'll, what I've heard is you just need more law. You need to understand the law more. But if you get what the law does, what the purpose of the law is, it's to do those five works in your life to bring you to a knowledge of how much you need the power of God's grace in your life. There's nothing wrong with the law. Please don't hear that. It's righteous, holy, and good. But it's God's grace, the, His powerful grace and His gracious power that I've seen so operative in your life as a church and in my life, my wife's life, my sister's life. And then lastly, for the grace of God has appeared instructing us to live godly. And this is godlessness, to live as though God exists. To live, and the word is a compound word that means to well worship. To worship well. In other words, we are, grace brings us into a place where when Andy and the band plays, I, I love to worship, and at times I get carried away, but the Lord just, this kind of abandonment, just to give yourself over to Him and say, I'm yours, Lord. So grace is what teaches us to deny the things of the world and deny, to deny the life as though God doesn't exist. And it's grace which teach me, teaches us to live sensibly, soberly, with self-control, to live justly and righteously in right relationship with God and to live godly, well-worshipping, living not the functional atheist life, but living in the power of, of, of God. And then it adds in the present evil age or in the present age, and it has a connotation of evil age. So, I have an illustration of this. This is kind of embarrassing, but do I have enough time? Yeah. So, five years ago, I was diagnosed, actually six years ago, but I was diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer, which went to my bone. And so they put me on hormone deprivation therapy. Um, and then six months later, I was to go on, go through 39 radiation treatments, which was weird, because they put you in this room, lie you on this little table that sticks out, and this big machine twirls around you as it shoots arrows of, of radiation into your body. And they shut a door that's a foot thick. And they all have little tags on them to see how much radiation they've gotten. And I'm thinking, help! <laughs> so I was about halfway through, and they, they told us how close we'd get to the technicians. But really, we only spent less than a minute or two with the technicians as they got us set up. So I realized they're not going to really get to know me. I thought I had an opportunity to do some sharing of my faith and to share the gospel. So I came up with uh, Essay Fridays. And I'd give them an essay each Friday, a new essay. And I started with the technicians and the people I knew. And more and more people started asking for them. But it was all about how faith is helping me to cope with having cancer and my testimony and so on. So I ended up giving them 11 essays. And at the end, I was giving 36 essays out. And that's not to put up myself. That was God's work. He called me. He's, he's allowed me to have cancer. So I would end up in that clinic. The, the, the receptionist asked me, I want you to write a paper for me. I want you to write a paper on the three reasons the three main reasons for the stigmata. And I'm thinking, and I'm thinking embarrassed to myself, what are stigmata? I... So I went and looked them up. Well, it's the wounds of Jesus. 
So I wrote him a, a three-page single-space letter on why, geez, what those mean. And I won't go into that, but, you know, God just kept opening up these doors for me. So about halfway through, I get, I get to radiation that day, and I'm, I'm done, and I'm just leaving, and they said, we have something for you. And they brought this, Nancy's going to help me, they, they brought this, or Nancy and Eleanor is going to help me, my sister, Eleanor, two of my best friends, these are the diamonds of my life. So they gave me this, and it's because they knew my story of being an alcoholic. So you probably can't see it, but it says, it says, uh, God grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change. The courage to change the things we can and the wisdom to know the difference. It's Reinhold, Reinhold Niebuhr's serenity prayer. From We say it in AA all the time. And I was so moved because they didn't know who to give this to because it's, it's, it's meant for an alcoholic. And realizing who I was, they gave it to me. So thank you. So I was so jazzed. And Nancy was working in Silverdale. This was up in Paulsbo. And so I thought, I got to go show Nancy my, my new quilt. I, I was just ecstatic. It's always dangerous for an alcoholic to be ecstatic. <laughs> so I was coming south on, on Highway 3 from Paulsbo, two-lane highway. Some cars were going rather slowly in the right lane. And I got to tell you, I always pr prided myself in my life for being a very good driver because I, I learned on a clutch from my dad in, on the hills of Tacoma. I, I drove in Chicago with the best of them. I drove in Tokyo where driving was, if you couldn't read kanji signs, uh, it was an interesting task. But so I prided myself on being a very good uh, driver. Well, these cars were driving in the right lane slow, and I was behind two, lane, two cars in the left lane. And a gal screams up on my tail and gets right behind me. So in the manual it says, slow down a little bit. The Washington State Driver's Manual. So I slowed down a little bit, which ticked her off. <laughs> and so she had the distance to me. Then I did the aggressive thing. My Family kept telling me, you're an aggressive driver, Grant. No, I'm not. I'm just a good driver. <laughs> Sometimes we're blind to our own life. So I tapped the brakes, which you're not supposed to do, and that really ticked her off. Now she closed the distance. I couldn't see her headlights, just her <laughs> and flipping me off and yelling at me. And So we got up to where the freeway opens up into three lanes, and so I moved over into the center. And I saw my opportunity because there was no one in the right lane. So I zipped over to the right lane and started speeding up. And just then, one of the cars in front of me in the middle lane flipped over to the right lane. So I flipped back to the left lane, got past her, got over to the right lane, and sped up to 76 to get away from this gal. She sped up to 90 <laughs> and comes screaming up and gets in front of me and slams on her brakes down to 15 miles an hour where I almost hit her. I'm starting to lose my cool at this point. We then go at 15 miles an hour, proceeding down to the Silverdale exit. We get off on the walk away, and I go to go around her. And she again cuts me off and slams on her brakes. And I missed her by about six inches. At this point, I have lost my temper. I mean, I have lost it. So she pulls back over into the right lane. I get in behind her. I'm going to give her a piece of my mind. And that's when the state patrolman <laughs> turned on his lights. Two weeks before, I had prayed that the Lord would put this aggressive driving to death in me, that the Holy Spirit would put it to death. Out of Romans chapter 8, if you are putting to death the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit, you will live. Well, he comes walking up to the car, and I know I'm in trouble. I've been changing lanes. I was speeding. Now I'm in road rage. Here, I'm a pastor. <laughs> and I'm going to end up in jail. So he asked me what happened, and I told him the story. And I did pull the cancer card. I'm just coming back from radiation. But he asked for my registration, my insurance, and my license. He walks away, and I'm just sitting there, sweating bullets, thinking I can't pray that God would save me because this is your fault. He comes back, and he says, I'm not going to give you a ticket today. And if I did give you a ticket, you would be in serious hurt today. 
just keep it down to the speed limits. Next time somebody does that to you, pull over to the side of the road and stop. What did I deserve? A hefty ticket, probably some jail time. What did the Lord give me through that officer? Grace. And you know what? It cured me. I've never wanted to drive aggressively since. Grace teaches us to say no to worldly desires and how to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but at the very end it says, and to purify him for himself, a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. So if you have a people who are taught by grace, it ends up that they want to do good, good deeds. And then notice what it says. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Sometimes people have told me, you preach too much grace, Grant. Just let me remind you, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Grace is what's going to teach us and what has been teaching us. Amen.